Well, good morning. I'm uh, joined by Assistant Commissioner Stuart Smith from the New South Wales Police and Commander Brett James from the Australian Federal Police. We'll, all three of us will speak. Uh, and if you have any difficult questions, Superintendent Rob Critchlow will easily take them. I'm not sure. But this is a great day for policing in Australia. Uh, it, is a, a, it is an absolute pleasure to be able to announce that overnight, uh, Superintendent Critchlow and his team, uh, alongside the Queensland Police and uh, uh, with the support of the Australian Federal Police and the wonderful work that they've done, New South Wales Crime Commission, uh, we have brought back uh, into custody a man who was seriously going to do harm to our children. Uh, and the work that's been done over the last two weeks, the way that the police and law enforcement agencies have embraced technology, they've worked um, uh, within, uh, the, within their own organisations, uh, seamlessly with uh, the other agencies, uh, has seen this wonderful result. And I think on the back of uh, last week's work by the Western Australian Police with Little Cleo, uh, we can say that these are uh, a wonderful times for policing in this country. And it's proof positive to anybody that wants to do harm to our children, who wants to be involved in the drug trade, who wants to uh, trade in, uh, in, the, uh, in the type of activities that we've seen both here and overseas, uh, you are not safe in Australia. Can I also apologise uh, to the international uh, law enforcement agencies whose, uh, whose work led to the arrest, assisted us in the arrest originally of um, uh, this individual uh, and of course the anxiety that's been caused over the last two weeks because of the um, very questionable decision to give him bail in the first place. Uh, credit of course to Superintendent Rob Critchlow uh, and his team uh, who have been ruthless uh, over the last two weeks in making sure that they did not miss a beat when it comes to monitoring and of course eventually capturing uh, uh, Mustafa. Uh, I have already this morning been in touch with my counterpart, Mark Ryan, the Minister for Police in Queensland, and I'm tracking down the constable that did the famous knock on the side of the truck. Uh, he'll get a beer and a hug from me when the borders open, and if that's not an enticement for uh, Queensland to open the borders, I don't know what is. Uh, but this is such a very, very happy day for policing. For all of the work that's been done, the critics of the way that uh, they've been responding to, uh, uh, to the work that uh, Superintendent Critchlow particularly had done, those that thought that uh, uh, Mustafa would never be brought to justice uh, can now just reflect on the fact that uh, first class, well resourcing policing um, will never, um, we'll never see a bad guy get away. To say that the government is thrilled uh, would be an understatement. Uh, to say that it's come at the right time um, because of the way that the international drug trade has been, uh, will probably evolve over the, uh, over the end of the COVID lockdown. Uh, means that uh, we can now go back to the world, our international agencies and of course the other state jurisdictions to say that bit, what, the policing is back when it comes to drug enforcement. I'll now hand over to Assistant Commissioner Smith uh, and he'll make a few remarks. Thank you Minister. Uh, early June, um, Strike Force Jellabanen um, resulted in the apprehension of numerous offenders in Sydney and operating internationally who were involved in the importation of over three tonne of cocaine to this country. Obviously Mustafa Belouche was accused of participating in one of those shipments which is 900 kilograms and obviously he faced central local court on the 21st where he received conditional bail. Um, by the 25th the ankle bracelet he was wearing was removed and probably one of the largest fugitive hunts in the country commenced. This has been a four state operation. I thank the Victorian Police, the South Australian Police, the Queensland Police, my colleagues in New South Wales. In particular, the work done by the Australian Criminal Intelligence Commission, the Australian Federal Police Border Force, who have all worked every day on this operation, beating the brush and getting this fugitive into position where an arrest could be made. So at last night at 1 a.m., um, an individual was removed from inside a vehicle, inside a container uh, on the back of a truck in, on the Queensland New South Wales border. And like the Minister said, um, we can only keep thanking the constable who tapped on the side of the particular truck in question and obviously received um, an acknowledgement that there was an individual inside that we all started celebrating. Um, this is an extensive operation. We have thrown everything at it human source intelligence, international agencies, technologies from multiple agencies that has brought us to the position of this apprehension. 
Obviously, um, he will face Southport Court today. There's an investigative team travelling today up to start the extradition procedure where he will be returned to Sydney to face court. Question, oh sorry, Brett. Yep. Thanks Stuart, uh, thanks Minister. Um, the AFP is obviously deeply concerned that over 70% of our transnational and serious organised crime high end targets reside overseas and continue to attempt to cause considerable harm to the Australian community through the importation of drugs. Mr Belouche was another example of an individual trying to evade uh, uh, justice but also escape uh, Australian waters and join up with his colleagues and continue to ply his trade overseas and cause harm to our community. Mr Belouche was charged as a result of Operation Ironside um, in relation to over 40 kilograms, the importation of 40 Greek kilograms of co uh, cocaine. We all know uh, the value of the high-end capabilities that the AFP have, have, have developed as a result of Operation Ironside. And we all know that the AFP will continue to develop high-end technical capability uh, to fight crime. Uh, and to stay a, hepa, stay a step ahead of crime. I'd like to congratulate all the members that have been on the ground. There have been numerous agencies that have been mentioned today that have played a key role uh, in the success of, of this operation. Uh, a lot of boots on the ground, but also a lot of technical experts and a lot of high-end technical capability that led to the information uh, that led to Mr Belusha's um, capture. Congratulations to everybody um, and uh, look forward to seeing him in front of the courts in the next uh, couple of days when he gets back to New South Wales. Thank you. Just some questions on the logistics if we could. I'm Mr. Mr. Crislow, how did you know he was in a truck heading north? Uh, we received information that he was likely to be travelling in a truck uh, to escape New South Wales, uh, but really came down to the diligence of the Queensland Police uh, Service to check the, the trucks coming through Tweed Heads and they made that discovery. They noticed uh, some suspicious items uh, with the container that wasn't properly locked. There was other things that brought their attention. And as we've said uh, famously, there was a knock on the side of the truck and he knocked back. So uh, he was a bit shocked when we found him and uh, it was just good police work, ultimately that secured his, 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 his arrest. So the, the Queensland officers have been, the Queensland officers, what, over the past week or so have been checking trucks looking for police? No, this is a, a, a recent development. Um, this information was quite fresh and it was acted upon as soon as it came in. So they, they knew it was a truck but not specifically this truck? Correct, we knew it was a truck so it was still a lot of police work and diligence to go in to find it. How, many, how many trucks were, were checked? Several. Yeah. It's a large op dozens? La la dozens, a large operation because you know, obviously trucking at night time moving through that border is quite big. Do we, do we know his movements leading up to his discovery? Uh, we're still piecing that together but we know for certain, uh, you may be aware we searched a number of houses last week and. Uh, see several hundred thousand dollars and uh, other items connected with drug trafficking. We know for sure he had been at some of those addresses, so we were close behind him all the way. Uh, we have identified what we'll allege is a, is a drug trafficking syndicate, which we are now uh, dismantling as a result of this investigation. And he was certainly, uh, we will allege, uh, connected with that group. He must have had a fair amount of help over the past couple of weeks. How many people do you think were helping him? Uh, he had a couple of helpers, but he had a lot of people against him. Um, the support and attention from the community really have turned the criminal element against him. A lot of people were then assisting us and giving us information. Uh, he became what we call as being hot. Uh, he attracted a lot of attention and uh, it's, it's causing impacts for people he knows. So uh, even, we promised that. Even other crooks were, were turning on? We promised this very early that we would look at everybody he knows and everyone he talks to and we have. And we've achieved excellent results and we're going to continue with that. You, you, told, you told us a couple of weeks ago that he was actively making efforts to get out of the country. Was, was that part of the plan to get to Queensland and then escape? Uh, he's looking at different options. We also looked at one in New South Wales, which was really well advanced. Uh, but he was desperate to leave Australia um, and, d and join up with some uh, colleagues overseas. Have you spoken to Interpol and had a response from other international authorities? That was commenced, yes. Uh, those contacts were made. Uh, we really left no stones unturned. We, we really made sure that all the gaps were, were looked at and controlled. Uh, and we didn't want to leave any opportunities for this man to flee. We knew the people overseas were waiting for him to come and join with them, which was of great concern, as the commander has said, that our high-end targets live overseas, and this would have caused enormous harm to our community going forward, so we were determined he wouldn't leave Australia. Are there likely to be any further charges against him or anyone else as a result of the manhunt? Yes, substantial charges. I, I can announce that the uh, driver of the truck has been detained. Uh, the truck was stopped at Grafton uh, just recently, just before we started this conference, in fact. 
Uh, that gentleman has been uh, detained by police. Uh, he will be charged in relation to conveying uh, the, the wanted person out of the jurisdiction. Uh, he also will face further inquiries about other uh, related offences. Uh, off that, the Traffic and Highway Patrol section are now going through that tracking company with a fine tooth comb. And we understand that there will be very few trucks left on the road tomorrow when they're finished. Uh, Mr Belouche has a number of serious charges which will be preferred by our partners in the AFP, um, arising from Ironside and other inquiries, so a lot more people to go. Mr Critchlow, do you believe that the truck driver knew he had Mustafa Belouche in the back? 100%. Were they, were they associates? Yes. So was he, a, was he a truck driver, was his job, or was he just acting as a truck driver last night? Uh, this, this gentleman has a trucking company, he's involved in transportation, but also he transports other commodities from time to time. So he's someone who's been of interest to us. This is um, uh, Mr. Belouche has given us chances to keep on keep on giving to us. He's opened opportunities we didn't have before, uh, and this is really exciting for us because it's, it's given us um, great potential to just really dissolve a major trafficking syndicate. Can you talk us through his reaction when he was found? I mean, was he, was he shocked? We can say that he was surprised. Pre presuming you know that Belouche appears in Central Local this afternoon or tomorrow. Do you have a message for the magistrate? Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't comment on that. Look, all we can do, and I've said this before, is that we gather the evidence. We we uh, put the evidence before the court, and that's how the system works. And uh, we'll leave that to the uh, to the judiciary. What country was he trying to go to? You know, right? Oh, I'd, I'd say Europe. I wouldn't be more precise than that. Can you be more precise? I won't be more precise. Thank you. What about his bail? Why didn't prosecutors flag an intention to appeal his bail? Like no, I won't be touching questions on bail. Thanks. What about the two men who you believe were in the front of the Range Rover? They've been, charged. Uh, they've been spoken to in great depth. Um, they are certainly under a lot of pressure and they're likely to face further proceedings. Mr Elliott, you may have an opinion, I'm sorry Rob, regarding a message to the magistrate who will preside over this case in the next 24 hours. Well, Rob, I assume he wasn't wearing a seatbelt either, so I would like to think that the magistrate will uh, look at all of the evidence put before them and make a very, very considered opinion as to whether this guy was a flight risk. He may not have had a border pass, so I assume, to get into Queensland. Oh, again, uh, I don't care if he was not wearing a hat in the sun. Whatever he has been, whatever the police can get on him, I would like to think that they will put to the magistrate. How bad would it have been for Australia if he wasn't found? Oh, well, as I said from day one, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed for the Australian Federal Police because they had to go and tell our international law enforcement partners that uh, we had lost one of the big ones. Uh, and it was embarrassing that uh, a, a suburban magistrate was responsible. Uh, I was embarrassed because of the cost um, to uh, investigate him in the first place, let alone the cost of the last two weeks. I mean, uh, Assistant Commissioner Smith has uh, uh, insinuated to me that, uh, you know, this was not an inexpensive operation getting him back behind bars and it could have got a lot worse if he'd left the shores. I was embarrassed because I didn't want our, our law enforcement partners overseas to think that um, uh, we weren't serious when it came to the drug trade. Uh, so um, to say that I'll be skipping around all day today would be an understatement. I think that today is going to be what's considered one of the great days of New South Wales Police. It's been great police work. Uh, it, uh, it reassures the community that all of our agents, unlike other uh, overseas jurisdictions, all of our agencies work hand in glove together. Uh, and, uh, and this is the sort of good result you can get. Can you provide any detail on the cost and the resources involved? I, I, I'd have nightmares if I even started to think about it. So, um, but I, if it's one dollar, it's one dollar unnecessarily spent. Uh, but um, what it also says to me that the technology that we use, the training that's available to our officers, uh, the intelligence network that uh, Assistant Commissioner Smith and Commander James have developed over the years uh, has all been um, worthwhile. So the investment into policing today uh, has been proven to be a good investment. What's the current situation with that $4 million uh, mansion that was, was given a surety? Is that well, let's, I, think my, I think Matt Keane is going to be very happy today. That, because the Treasurer will now get access to that money. That's what happens. It was forfeited and any suggestion, as the Commissioner said in Estimates Committee, uh, it is fanciful to think that uh, this guy was kidnapped. He clearly wasn't kidnapped. I'm assuming he wasn't being held um, against his will when Superintendent and Critchlow's people found him. Uh, so. Um, if uh, if justice is um, if justice is uh, is uh, pursued today, well then uh, he will forfeit his bail. But what is the process of actually physically getting the key? That when does the state get the keys to the house and and then potentially put it on the market? How, I mean, oh, listen, that that's that's. Do you know how they do that? Steve. 
So there's a number of moving parts in terms of the civil forfeiture investigation that is underway as we speak. The house was put up as a surety, it was forfeited as part of the process when he did, when he cut off the ankle bracelet, I don't think the first thing in was, was his mind is surrendering a $4 million house. We are pursuing numerous assets by this syndicate and in particular this individual. It won't be the last asset seizure we make. But will, will, will you actually get hold of <coughs> that property? And will, the property is now forfeited to the state. Uh, are you able to provide detail on the cost of resources New South Wales Police committed to this? Uh, I think in terms of it, I spelled it out at the start, it wasn't just New South Wales Police. There are several agencies that have worked around the clock since the 25th um, to pursue this fellow. The cost, I can't put a cap on it at the moment, but I know it is. Ex it, it would be extraordinary. So homicide are lead, leading a very complex, comprehensive investigation with the Deputy State Coroner, with LEC, our oversight body, and with investigators from PSC. All, all I can give you at this moment is there's an exhaustive amount of work being done at the crime scene. We're processing that. We will then work through the legal process around interviewing the officers. Obviously our sympathy goes to the family who have lost someone, but also, importantly, to the officers affected by this tragedy. All rendered first aid at the scene. All have been affected by this tragedy. Was the person who was shot yesterday the same person that the warrant was executed against? I understand that to be true. Can I ask on luxury cars? Yes, you can. What's the, what are police appealing for today? Um, obviously, over the last 12 months, we've, we've seen a a uh, quite considerable feud occurring between two organised crime families. The strike force investigation has resulted in the seizure of 43 high-end cars which were used in serious violent crime. We are asking the public to help us around four particular vehicles which have been taken from the northern suburbs of Sydney. Those vehicles bear plates that have been circulated which we believe may may be going to be used in serious violent crime. There is a fleeting moment where these vehicles are used in these serious crimes where members of the public interact with people running to a getaway vehicle. We're asking, we're urging the public to provide information around these four high-end vehicles, I believe two Mercs, a Porsche and a uh, Cooper Mini or a GTI um, vehicle. Those vehicles those plates circulated, we're asking public to provide information around them so that we can seize them and apprehend those using them. Um, obviously, we've been very successful with a community appeal last time. Thank you. Has uh, the crooks really changed their mode of operation? Wasn't there a day where they actually <coughs> liked to fly under the radar, not drive high performance cars around the joint? Look, in terms of the use of the high-end vehicles, obviously the escaping the scene of a shooting or a homicide that we've seen in Sydney in the past or other violent crime, they, they, they use these high-end vehicles to escape the scene and obviously interaction with police law enforcement. Um, this is the vehicles they choose. Obviously the appeal is so that we can get to this very quickly. We've seized 43 others, we will seize these, but we need the community's help. The people that are stealing the cars, <coughs> do you believe they're getting paid big bucks to do so? I think in terms of what we've seen in the last year, we've seen subcontracting to syndicates. Um, they obviously get paid significant money for their participation in either the whole crime or parts of a syndicated crime. Who are the gangs enlisting to steal them? How worrying is it? Look, in terms of it, what we've seen from from the operations, so Strike Force Hawk is a 75% drop in the theft of high-end vehicles. Having said that, these four vehicles that we're interested in have been recently taken and we believe they may be being used now or will be used in other violent crime. And you mentioned it might be obvious that they could be parked in locations. Look, we've seen, we've recovered numerous other vehicles from storage facilities underneath blocks of flats. This is this fleeting moment where there's an opportunity that a member of public will see these plates. Um, we've seen the use of clone plates used on these vehicles. There, there's obviously specifics around these plates we think that will make them useful to these criminal gangs. We're urging the public to help us. Why are they targeting the north side? Sorry? Why are they targeting the north side? Um, obviously more affluent suburbs. 
um, have access to a lot of high-end vehicles um, and the luxury car market, obviously these crooks hunt where the product is. And the message to those people is to keep your garages locked up? We always do. Lock your car, even inside the garage at night, set your alarm. I can't be clearer. Mr Quickso, would you mind if we just asked you a couple more questions about the um, uh, Mr Belouche? The, um, the officer that knocked on the, the side of the, the truck, can you just explain why that officer was knocking and then and what you took the response to mean? Um, well, we were looking for a person. I think it was just a bit of a specky. So, you know, there's a lot of trucks going through. The, the, the absence of locks on the container was suspicious. He felt the need to knock on the truck and the occupant felt the need to knock back. So we, we suspect that the, uh, that the person inside the truck felt there was a drop-off point that was being signalled that it was safe. Um, he'd been there for some time, of course, it was right time to get out. Didn't realise there was a constable doing the duty. And had Mr Belouche been in one of the seats of the car? I, I noticed one of the pictures, the boot was open. Was he in the boot or in the My understanding seat? is that he was sitting in one stage in the seats, uh, but he was removed out through the back of the car because you couldn't open the doors. Yeah. Just a quick one from the Minister. Mm -hmm. um, what concrete steps are you taking to make sure that bail laws are stronger? Well, there's, uh, well, other than the full and frank discussions I'm currently having with the Attorney General, um, uh, there is a review of the Bail Act at the moment. Uh, but uh, listen, I mean, I, uh, I, I think what we've seen over the course of the last couple of weeks is proof that this review is justified. Uh, and I don't think that I can say anything more than um, what I've said, and that is magistrates need to put front of mind whether or not the community will, will be put at risk if somebody is released on bail. How angry are you? Oh, well, I can't express it any harder. I mean, it was... And I, I'm not just angry from a, from a policing point of view because I've got to speak um, on behalf of the 17,000 police officers that spend all day, every day, putting briefs to courts to um, get bad people off the streets. But I think the community expectation of our judicial system is that uh, bail is a privilege offered to people who, um, um, with the presumption of innocence, uh, should be given the opportunity to uh, to prepare um, their own defence and uh, maybe their their, uh, their offences don't justify incarceration straight away. Uh, but when we're talking about Mustafa Belush, I think that the the, uh, uh, the, uh, the way that the police approached it and their instincts were proven correct. I know we very much keep politics and the judiciary separate, but how do you sack a judge or a magistrate? Not you, but the yeah. process. Well, the, only the parliament can sack a judge or a magistrate. And I'm not suggesting that we sack judges and magistrates unless there's corruption or severe levels of incompetence. And, but, um, and you're quite right. We do have to keep the parliament and the judiciary separate. That's the, one of the great um, institutions uh, of uh, the Westminster system is the separation of powers. But um, as the police minister, I'm obliged to provide um, air cover for the officers in the New South Wales Police Force who may just not want to get up in the morning thinking that they're not going to get the conviction that um, uh, they've, uh, they've investigated. But I've also got to, as a member of parliament, we've also got to speak on behalf of the community and make sure that the judiciary um, reflects the, um, the, uh, the, the, the public's sentiments. And that's clearly um, not happened on one or two occasions in recent times. Uh, ask you about the service New South Wales COVID fraud. Is there any? Uh, actually, Mr. Smith is all over. All over. That might be rush. Okay. Um, on Monday, Service New South Wales referred a significant fraud, so 13,000 uh, reports to the New South Wales Police, under the direction of the Financial Crime Squad. Um, and, and the Commissioner of Police, we have established Strike Force Sainsbury. So a team of more than 50 investigators will be stationed at Parramatta. <clears throat> we will be using the artificial intelligence um, analytics system that we developed in the Ruby Princess Inquiry and the bushfires to sort through the metadata to obviously identify syndicates who we believe are involved in defrauding the COVID-19 uh, small business grants. Um, obviously not all grants are a subject of fraud. Obviously when there is a community interface, so an interface system where the public apply for grant monies, th this is where crooks flourish and they target those. Um, those people that have already committed, we, we think, multiple frauds, they can expect a door knock in the near future. Yeah, how, much, how much money are we talking about? What we believe so far, and, and we're only working through the process of sorting the data, the massive data which investigators are going through now, 
is there's around 15.9 million in the first fraudulent component, probably another four million dollars in grants out of a billion, multi-billion dollar scheme. Um, we will work through that. We will work with Service New South Wales to identify those individuals. And very similar to the childcare scheme operation that we ran, people are going to get door knocks and people will be facing court. Would you be able to offer your opinion on the, the, this kind of crime, like the <coughs> plotting that this uh, assistance for assault? Look, we've seen through a number of tragedies in New South Wales, bushfires obviously was one of the big ones and the COVID-19 period where government sets up a scheme to help small business get back on its feet. It's rather disappointing that fraudsters obviously seek to target this, but it is a business, cyber crime and obviously fraud crime that comes with, you know, people attacking these kind of grants, but I can guarantee you in New South Wales, the investigators will be catching up with you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.